quiet enough that even with some folks getting coffee, we could begin with a word of prayer here. Let's, let's do that. Lord, once again, you call us into life. You call us together. You call us to be part of the body of Christ, as you have called it. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to be here with one another and to be opened uh, to that which you have to teach us through those people you've sent to, to teach us, like Martin Luther. And I pray that your Holy Spirit may be our teacher this day, O oh God, that as we study the, the prayer that you have taught us to pray, it may more and more make a big difference in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And in our third study here on the Catechism of Martin Luther, which we're doing for about five weeks here, we'll uh, continue with uh, baptism next week and then the Lord's Prayer following that. But today, the Lord's Prayer, I mean, how many times, I was thinking, how many times in my life have I prayed the Lord's Prayer? How could you begin to count? Probably tens of thousands, quite literally. But I have to confess, there still are times when I go through it as a matter of course and forget the incredible riches that are there. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to revisit things like the catechism from time to time. Not simply to learn academically what Lutherans taught about this in the 16th century, but so that we might be enriched in our own life with God. And that's why the purpose of this, oh, I see, speaking of the purpose of this class, I've gone totally black here. Let's see, let's see if I can get this back here. Okay, Scott, on, there we go. Okay. All right, well, that's been happening about every five minutes so far, so I better talk real fast here, see what I get in in five minutes. But again, the, the, the purpose is not simply what Lutheranism taught once upon a time, but what can it teach us about living as Christians today? And I hope you all have a copy of the small catechism in your hands. Once again, no big deal here at all, but just in terms of... Uh, a, a, a little bit of uh, technicality here in terms of printing these things. Feel free to, to write on this, to take it home if you want, uh, but if you do take it home and, and write on it, then I would ask that you bring it back next week. No big deal at all, but uh, then I won't have to ask uh, for, for more uh, copies and more paper, and I'll just collect what's left afterwards. And it worked out real well a couple of weeks ago. So anyway, thank you for that, but I hope it's, and we've got plenty of them sitting around if for some reason you don't have enough uh, there, there are uh, some copies on every table, and uh, it's very important to have that in your hands because I'll be referring to that very, very typically, uh, very many, many times this day, starting with Luther's uh, introduction to the Lord's Prayer, again, something we pray every time we <laughs> gather just about as Christians in, in worship and so forth, how often we have said it, but what a gospel there is just in the first four or five words here, our Father who art in heaven, our Father. I mean, think about that, because again, it can come so commonly off our lips. But the Lord who made heaven and earth, who made the far reaches of this incredible universe, who made the tiny, tiny, tiny DNA in our trillions of cells, that God wants to be and is our Father. And so Luther very warmly in the introduction in saying, what does this mean? Says that here God encourages us to believe that he is truly our father. We are his children. Think of what it's like to be a father. Think of what it was like to be a child. And God wants that. This God of the universe wants that relationship with us. And then as Luther says, we're to therefore pray to him with complete confidence, just as children speak to their loving Father. Does that ever go through our minds and hearts when we begin? Well, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together, our Father. Our... Does something of the wonder of that strike you? I all too often am, am dulled to that. I've got to learn and relearn what uh, Luther taught so long ago and what I first learned so long ago. We can pray like a little child when it comes to what really, really matters in life, addressing our Heavenly Father. Think of it, we can pray with all the confidence, with all the joy of a little child praying to, in this case, her Heavenly Father. Isn't it wonderful what we can learn from children sometimes? And so that's the most obvious 
emphasis, it seems, in this small catechism we're going to see running through all of us, that we can really pray to God as our Father. And again, many times as we've heard that, have we really absorbed that? Do we really know what it is that today, right now, we are in the presence of our Father? Again, it's the gospel in miniature. Our Father, who art in heaven, pervades heaven and earth, we can pray to. But Luther also, knowing that we're in a fallen world, we're in a sinful world, we don't always act like children of God, Luther also stresses in his large catechism, and once again today we'll have a lot of references on the screen from the large catechism, he also talks in terms of duty and command. He knows that we, we need that very often. To pray as the second commandment teaches, if you recall what he said about uh, what the second commandment means, not simply not taking the Lord's <laughs> name in, 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 ter- in vain in terms of swearing and so forth, but turning to God with prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. That's what the uh, small catechism says about the second commandment. And he pretty well reiterates that here. It's to call upon God in every need. But look at this. Look at his emphasis here. This God requires of us. It is not a matter of our choice. You know, we may think, well, I'll pray when I kind of feel like it or if I'm in a group where they say, let us pray. Okay, of course, I w-. No, Luther says, because he knows that there is that side of us that does need that prompting and prodding of the law, as it were. It is our duty and obligation to pray if we want to be Christian on pain of God's wrath and displeasure. This is the other side of Luther. He doesn't simply say, well, God is gracious, and therefore you can forget about his wrath. No, he doesn't say that. Matter of fact, I don't like it when when I hear phrasing well-intentioned, though it is, that, that might say, well, God is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. Now, it sounds like two almost competing emotions, as it were, in God. No, it's because God is a God of love that he's also a God of wrath, because what is God's wrath? I'm convinced God's wrath means the form his love takes when his love is resisted, when his love is not followed, when we don't pray and respond as children to our Heavenly Father. Very similar to experiences we've all had just about as parents, where you you treat a child in, in one form when they're very obedient to you and you feel very loving, that they're very loving to you, and then when they willfully disobey you, your love, it's still love for them. You care about them. That's why you're going to exercise some kind of discipline, I hope. You're going to treat them in a different way, still loving them because, well, as the Bible says, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. So again, when Luther says wrath, it's important to keep in mind. It isn't that, well, Luther used to be worried about God's uh, wrath, and then he discovered the gospel and left that all behind. No, again, we're sinful, fallen creatures, and the wrath of God is the way his love operates when we resist him. But there is that element of duty, and yet Luther stresses far more the idea that we can pray with real confidence because there's a promise attached. And again, here from virtually everything I'm going to show you that isn't an obvious pictorial uh, portrayal of something is from the large catechism. And that is, in the large catechism, the one that's much more detailed and that he wrote for pastors and leaders and so forth. He said, uh, in the second place, what ought to impel and arouse us to pray is the fact that God has made and affirmed a promise that what we pray is a certain and sure thing. As Christ says in Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you to everyone who, uh, for everyone who asks receives. Such promises certainly ought to awaken and kindle in our hearts a longing and love for prayer. So it isn't just, oh boy, uh, I can't be a real Christian here if I don't pray. Do we know that love and that concern and that promise enough that we want to pray? It just comes almost second nature to us. For by his word, God testifies that our prayer is heartily pleasing to him and will assuredly be heard and granted. And that is encouraging, isn't it? That, that God actually wants us. We can learn this from these classical Lutheran teachings. God really wants to hear from us, just as we would as parents 
want to hear the needs of our children, want to know that they have confidence in us. By the way, the reason, I've said this before, but there are new folks here today, uh, the reason I read all of these, even though you can fully read them for yourselves, I think in just about every instance, is that we do have people online and it isn't really visible there. So uh, again, just reiterating what I told the rest of you about three weeks ago, that, that's why I, I read all of these things out loud as well. And then Luther gives encouragement in prayer, as I just said, particularly about this thing called the Lord's Prayer. And this, this is an idea perhaps we haven't thought about too much, and I, I want to reiterate when I finish reading this first. That furthermore, we should be encouraged and drawn to pray because in addition to this commandment and promise, God takes the initiative, now speaking directly of the Lord's Prayer, God takes the initiative and puts into our mouths the very words and approach we are to use. In this way, we see how deeply concerned he is about our needs. And we'll see that as he develops the, the Lord's Prayer and what it means. And we should never doubt that such prayer, the prayer that he has taught us to pray directly, that such prayer pleases him and will assuredly be heard. You know, I think there's kind of a sense on the, on the some level at least, maybe on the part of almost every one of us, that somehow, well, these memorized prayers, they're fine, and the ones that we say every week in church, like the Lord's Prayer, that's fine, but, but the, the real prayer is, is the spontaneous prayer that we pray. Have you ever kind of had that thought? You know, get real about it, the person who can really pray in his or her own words. Well, Luther looks at this a little bit uh, differently. And after all, if you really stop and think of it, again, living in a fallen world, uh, maybe uh, significant though uh, our, our many prayers uh, can be, sometimes at the same time they can be rather, very, perhaps rather narrow-minded and, and self-centered and just wrong-headed. You know, well, Lord, give me this, or I sure would like that. And maybe sometimes God even feels like this, where he says to this prayer, Really, Harold, that's rather petty, you know. I, I, I wonder. But, 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 but sometimes, yeah, this idea that we can really be confident of these words. I have a certain uh, mental prayer list that I pray every morning. I, I haven't counted, but I bet 50 to 75 different causes and, and specific people are on that list that I pray. And, and I like to think my wording about certain things is, is right and proper in God's sight but I'm not as confident in the way I always phrase it uh, as I am uh, in praying the Lord's Prayer, or as I should be. I mean, Luther's really reminding me of some things. Don't put down those set prayers, those prayers that maybe we were taught as a child. If we, if our, we allow our minds to wander, as it certainly does happen, uh, and, and so forth, that, that's wrong. But if we take seriously what really has been taught to us, we can have the confidence, as we're going to see, through the study of the Lord's Prayer today, I hope, you know, how important this is and how far-reaching these prayers are. And we can be sure, because Jesus taught his disciples to pray that in the Sermon on the Mount, and then again in Luke 11 as well, a couple different times, a little different version in Luke 11, but the same general topics. And the one thing you can be sure of, and this is kind of, I, I've debated, should I show you this next thing or not? I, I remember showing it several years ago. Uh, it's something that sickens me, but unfortunately, I think it's still around where uh, a, a certain church, and I hate to say it, but a Lutheran church, uh, has, has decided uh, uh, we need to bring this up to date and make our own substitutions and be really with it in our modern world. So here's an example, again, with apologies that maybe I shouldn't even be showing it, but here is it is specifically, at least was on the website, that, and the church is still there. Uh, I checked that just the other day. But look at that, our mother who is within us. We celebrate your many names. Your wisdom come, your will be done, unfolding from the depths within us. Each day you give us all that we need. You remind us of our limits and we let go. You support us in our power and we act with courage. For you are the dwelling place within us, the empowerment around us, and the celebration among us now and forever. I'll stick with Jesus. I'll stick with Matthew 6. And uh, that, I, I think, is the, the prayer we can pray with the greatest 
confidence. But again, what we're doing this morning is a reminder that we need, and I'm speaking to myself here, uh, and, and to myself as well, <clears throat> need reminders of how rich this prayer is. So it isn't just a, a, a kind of set, <laughs> narrow-minded thing where we, where we shrink what Jesus really intends for us to pray in this prayer. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer as the Lord has taught us to pray, look at what Luther says about that. This prayer is far superior to all others that we might devise ourselves. For in that case, our conscience would always be in doubt, saying, I've prayed, but who knows whether it pleases him or whether I've hit upon the right form and mode. I guess they were just saying that in terms of, I hope my particular morning a prayer. It's not a memorized prayer, but I, I have pretty well memorized the things I pray for, and I tend to bring up the same phrases every morning, and, and I hope those are pleasing to God, but I can't have the confidence in that the way I can in the Lord's Prayer. Look what Luther says again, thus there's no nobler prayer to be found on earth, for it has the powerful testimony that God loves to hear it. So here's what to pray then. First of all, hallowed be thy name. Think just a minute what goes through your mind as you pray that? You know, let's say picture yourself where you would normally be seated or standing in, in the sanctuary here, for example. What do you tend to think of when you say, hallowed be thy name? Well, look what Luther says as you look at your small catechism. God's name certainly is holy in itself. We're not going to suddenly make it holy, in other words. But we ask in this prayer that we may keep it holy. Is that always kind of what's going on in in your heart when you pray that? And when does this happen? God's name is hallowed whenever his word is rightly taught and we as children of God live in harmony with it. Help us to do this, Heavenly Father. It's, in other words, something that's really on us here. But anyone who teaches or lives contrary to the word of God dishonors God's name among us. Keep us from doing this, Heavenly Father. And so in the large catechism, Luther says, in this petition, we pray for exactly the same thing that God demands in the second commandment, that his name should not be taken in vain by swearing, cursing, deceiving, etc., but used rightly to the praise and glory of God. Whoever uses God's name for any sort of wrong profanes and desecrates his holy name. To hallow means the same as in our idiom, to praise, extol, and honor both in word and deed. So notice what he's saying in the, in the small catechism. When we hear God's word rightly taught and we live in accordance with us, it isn't just, oh, your name is holy God and may it always be holy. No, his, na his name's going to be holy whether we pray for it or not. And it's important to pray for that part of it, but at the same time to continue with what Luther says. There's actually a parallel between these first three, and I'll point it out very explicitly in a little while, these first three petitions generally thought of as the more directly God-centered petitions with a lot of thee and thy and so forth. Second petition, thy kingdom come. It's not all that different from the first petition. God's kingdom comes indeed without our praying for it, but we ask in this prayer that it may come also to us. Is that what we're, what we're thinking of when we're standing in church and, and saying this or praying it at home? When does this happen? God's kingdom comes, not just at the second coming of Christ, though that'll be the culmination, but when our heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit so that by his grace we believe his holy word and live a godly life on earth now and in heaven forever. Now notice that. And, and again, think about the parallels, because as Luther says in the large catechism, all this is nothing more than to say, dear Father, we ask you first to give us your word so that the gospel may be properly preached throughout the world and that it may be also received in faith and may work and dwell in us so that your kingdom may prevail among us through the word and the power of the Holy Spirit. And how often do we think about this? That the devil's kingdom may be destroyed so that he may have no right or power over us until finally his kingdom is utterly eradicated and sin, death, and hell wiped out, that we may live forever in perfect righteousness and blessedness. Now, Luther's very conscious of the devil. We Lutherans have maybe gotten away from that 
in, in terms of emphasizing that as much as we should. And granted, Luther lived in very perilous times. He was almost sure for much of his life that he was going to be martyred. A lot was going on, all kinds of stuff in terms of Reformation history. Maybe that tended to incite more of this awareness of the devil's presence, but we're going to see that a lot, and I think we have so far. What it certainly means, though, and we Lutherans have sometimes forgotten this, is that if we take really seriously thy kingdom come on earth, what does that say about our attitudes towards certain things that claim to be so important and so ultimate, but that fall far short of God's kingdom? N.T. Wright, a pretty well-known Anglican bishop, Bishop of Durham, several years, this is quite a few years ago, in 1996, I noticed it says in Christianity Today magazine, you know, actually talks about, you know, we can't just acquiesce to the kingdoms around us. In other words, there's a certain kind of resistance, as it were. And at times, uh, Luther points that out. We'll, we'll uh, see that at, at some points here uh, in terms of a more activist stance that Luther takes. And we'll see that more in his next petition when he says, thy will be done, which just sounds like, okay, Lord, I know your will needs to be done, and you know, I hope all goes well in terms of getting your will done. No, look again what Luther says in the third petition. This means the good and gracious will of God. Yes, it's surely done without our prayer. He's not going to stop all his plans because we don't pray for them. But we ask in this prayer that it may be done also among us. Now, have you noticed this pattern that I've hinted at several times? I try to put on this slide here how these three God-centered petitions are at the same time asking something powerful in our life that we would truly hallow God's name, that we would truly have the kingdom of God come to us through our obedience by his Holy Spirit, and that although God's will is done without our prayers, we're praying may we do his will. And when is God's word, uh, and notice God's word is in every one of these petitions in, in, in Luther's explanation. That's why it's important to get this richer understanding of what we're really called to pray for. When does uh, God's will get done? Well, he says uh, in the small catechism here, God's will is done when he hinders and defeats every evil scheme and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful self, which would prevent us from keeping his name holy and would oppose the kingdom, the coming rather of his kingdom. And his will is done when he strengthens our faith and keeps us, ah, here we go again, firm in his word. So we're really praying something very active here. This isn't, again, just, okay, it's ultimately up to you, Lord, I'll, I'll confess that, your will be done. No, Luther, as I just said, often talks about battles against the devil, and certainly uh, Satan in his very subtle forms in our time has all kinds of temptations around us that'll be coming up. Uh, we who would be Christians, he says in the large catechism, must surely expect to have the devil with all his angels and the world as our enemies and must expect that they will inflict every possible misfortune and grief upon us. For where God's word is preached, accepted, or believed, and bears fruit, there the holy and precious cross, and here he means the cross in terms of our taking up the cross and suffering with him. Again, Luther was so aware. He just saw so many things in his time. They even had a big plague in Wittenberg. I was reminded the other day in 1527, right amidst the, the Reformation, and Luther and others stayed behind to help, whereas others fled, some others fled Wittenberg. But anyway, he had just everything you could imagine, death threats and the ban of the, the emperor against him and wars around, as we'll see in a little bit here. Don't think we're going to have peace, Luther says. This is, these are really fighting words, not just resignation. Okay, that will be. Done. No, we must sacrifice. Look at this. We must sacrifice all we have on earth, possessions, honor, house and farm, spouse and children, body and life. Now, this grieves our flesh and the old creature, for it means that we must remain steadfast, suffer patiently whatever befalls us, and let go whatever is taken from us. I mean, those are powerful words. In other words, not just passively <clears throat> accept God's will, but actively do it. And Luther realized, even though the princes in some cases were his allies, certainly realized that at times there's going to be conflict with, for example, the state. Kind of interesting the way he phrases it in the large catechism, I think, when he says such prayer 
must be our protection and defense now to repulse and vanish all that the devil, bishops, tyrants, and heretics can do against our gospel. Let them all rage and try their worst. Let them plot and plan how to suppress and eliminate us so that their will and scheme may prevail. But against them, a single Christian or two, armed with this single petition, shall be our bulwark against which they shall dash themselves to pieces. In other words, ultimately, even though it involves some real sacrifice, some real pain, ultimately doing the will of God in a very active sense is something one can do with the confidence that God's will and therefore what's ultimately going to happen is on our side if we are on his side. It seems to me, though, in, in that particular phrase, there's a really interesting lumping together of categories. Did you notice that? The devil, tyrants, heretics, and bishops. <laughs> but again, he takes a very assertive stance in this petition. And yet, for most of us, the biggest battle of all is against our own will. If we're really praying in this, Lord, Lord, may your will be done, not mine. That's probably where the battle really rages in our lives. And so this young woman, praying thy kingdom come, uh, says, uh, and God, if your will could match my will today, it would be mucho appreciated. <laughs> so our will versus God's will. Okay, I'll st there's a lot in there, isn't there, in, in, in the, uh, those petitions that we can so easily kind of slide over. And then we come to the very heart of the prayer, the middle petition, the fourth petition out of seven, very important. Give us this minute our next cup of coffee. So we better be sure to fulfill that there. <laughs> okay, we got a lot of ground to cover here in about the next 15 minutes because, again, I'm really trying to give you about 15 minutes for talking things over in, in table talk. But let's, let's move to this petition that, that starts uh, those petitions that may be a little bit more us-centered, so to speak, but I think we're going to see some different dimensions from Luther in this. But here's an example of uh, maybe a little bit of an expansion here on this uh, prayer where uh, this uh, uh, pastor basically is, give us this day our daily low-fat, low-cholesterol, <laughs> salt-free bread. I hate these modern translations. <laughs> <laughs> but Luther has a, a much more expansive translation of what these words really mean. And we see it right in the small catechism before us. What does it mean? God gives us daily bread, even without our prayer. Again, do you notice this whole thing? God's doing it in our prayer that, that gets God moving into action. He's going to give it to all people, those sinful. But we ask in this prayer that he will help us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanks. And now look, how often does this next part run through your mind when you pray this? Daily bread includes everything needed for this life, such as food and clothing, home and property, work and income, a devoted family, an orderly community, good government. <laughs> How often would you pray for daily bread? Do you think of government? Favorable weather, peace and health, a good name, and true friends and neighbors. Again, does this yeah, get us to thinking of something more than simply a, a piece of toast in the morning? <laughs> we ask that God would protect us from all kinds of harm to our body and the things that, uh, protection from uh, those things uh, that, uh, if they go wrong, would not sustain us, that, namely storms, hail, fire, and flood, poison, pestilence, cattle plague. <laughs> Luther's very down to earth. War and bloodshed, which again was going on at the time of the Reformation quite a bit, probably kept Luther alive because they had, uh, the rulers had more to fight than simply this one little heretic. Uh, famine, savage beasts, wicked people, and so forth. And here's one that might really be a surprise to most of us, that the greatest need of all is to pray for the civil authorities and government. I mean, in terms of daily bread, what would you think of this? For it is chiefly through them, you can, I suppose you can argue this a little bit, that God provides us daily bread and all the comforts of this life. Although we've received from God all good things in abundance, we cannot retain any of them or enjoy them in security and happiness were he not to give us a stable, peaceful government. Well, that's true. 
For when, where dissension, strife, and war prevail, their daily bread, which comes again from God, is already taken away, or at least reduced. And it occurred to me just this morning, probably the prime example of that in the 20, well, so many examples, unfortunately, in the 20th century, but think of Stalin's deliberately induced famine in Ukraine somewhere around 1930, I forget whether it's right before or right after or both. Stop and think. Government does not give daily bread, but they can certainly take it away. Never, I, I, frankly, I need to be reminded of that, that I'm praying that God's people who are given special areas of responsibility will not deprive people of the blessings that ultimately come from God. In addition, Luther says, we may ask God to endow with wisdom, strength, and prosperity, and kind of interesting here, the emperor, kings, and all estates, all classes of society, especially the princes of our land, all counselors, magistrates, and officials, so that they may, now this is interesting, I put this in here for a reason, so that they might govern well and be victorious over the Turks and all our enemies. On top of everything else in the 1520s, the Turks were just about literally knocking at the door, I think particularly of the situation in Vienna in 1529. I think, I think it was providential, because the weather had a lot to do with it, that the Turks were unable to take Vienna. They would have conquered much of Europe if they had Vienna as a base. So, so much is going on at the time of Luther. Oh, just so many, as I said, from plagues and, and the ban on his, his, his life, his very life being threatened, wars, Catholic versus Catholic, Pope versus, not so much Pope, but Italy and France versus the uh, Holy Roman Emperor and so forth. But the Turks, which were constantly a menace, were a major factor in allowing Luther to live, and God somehow used that, that the Reformation could prosper and grow. So an awful lot uh, was going on here. And so that's why uh, Luther includes this business of, of the Turks in what it's all about. <clears throat> but especially, this shouldn't be a surprise by now, is this petition directed against our chief enemy, the devil, whose whole purpose and desire it is to take away or interfere with all we have received from God. This is why he causes so much contention, murder, sedition, and war, etc. In short, it pains him that anyone should receive even a mouthful of bread from God and eat it in peace. God wants us to have the pleasure of our daily bread, but the devil would just as soon take it from us. And then here's another dimension of this petition. We, well, we, I referred to it briefly before. Small catechism here. God gives us daily bread even without our prayer. Uh, for all, gives daily bread to all people, though sinful. But we ask in this prayer that he'll help us to realize this and receive our daily bread with thanks. And that's so crucial. How often do we think of that we're, we're, when we pray? We really should be saying, Lord, may I be thankful to you. And again, is somewhat echoed in the large catechism, God gives these blessings even to the godless and rogues, but he wishes us to ask for them so that we may realize we have received them from his hand and may recognize in them his fatherly goodness toward us. So you see how we're really involved here, physically as well as spiritually. And then there's an even broader social dimension. It, it, I, I bring some of these things out just to talk about how very specific can uh, Luther can be in terms of some of the concerns in his own time. He says, how much trouble there is now in the world simply on account of false coinage. I no, don't think he means Bitcoin, but false coinage. <laughs> yeah. Yet on account of daily exploitation and usury in public business, commerce, and labor on the part of those who wantonly oppress the poor, so notice this social concern, and deprive them of their daily bread. This we must put up with, of course. I mean, it's, it's a part of life. But let those who do such things beware, lest they lose the common intercession of the church. Let them take care, lest this petition of the Lord's Prayer be turned against them. Now, maybe Luther, because of the particular situation in his time, had to say something that we probably would not say in the same terms today. You know, I'm at no point saying everything that Lutheranism teaches is directly applicable today. All this, you have to sift through the Holy Spirit in your own heart. When Luther says we must put up with this, uh, it, it, resistance 
is a part of it. And, and in the 20th century, I know of no single figure whose resistance uh, was, was more in, impelling and, and compelling and, and powerful than that of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Most of you are quite familiar with him. Died just a, a month or so before the end of World War II in prison because he was willing to be involved in a plot against Hitler. Bonhoeffer had something interesting, though, I thought to say about uh, this petition. I believe that God will give us all the strength we need to help us resist in times of distress, but he never gives it in advance lest we should rely on ourselves and not him alone. If you ever wondered why, give us this day our daily bread. It's just that. There's the explanation for that. So that we won't simply, okay, I got the money in the bank, now I'm all set, blah, blah, blah. No, we need to be reminded that day by day in this world of perils, day by day, we need God's continual help. And then goes on, of course, to talk about forgive us our trespasses, very, very crucial to the whole mission of the church. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. We ask in this prayer, the small catechism says, that our Father in heaven would not hold our sins against us and because of them refuse to hear our prayer. And we pray that he would give us everything by grace, for we sin every day and deserve nothing but punishment. Wow, so we really need that forgiveness. It's not that God does not forgive sins, even apart from and before our praying. Notice how frequently Luther is saying that. It isn't our prayer that causes this, because even before we prayed for it or even thought about it, he gave us the gospel in which there's nothing but forgiveness. But the point here is for us to recognize and accept this forgiveness. And he goes on to say, so we on our part will heartily forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. Very frequently the question comes, oh, wait a minute, because we can really slide by this fast. How much of a dependency is there that we must forgive others before we can receive God's forgiveness? Luther comes down pretty strongly, as Jesus did. You know, Jesus teaches this prayer in the early part of the, the version we have, anyway, in the early part of Matthew 6. And by Matthew uh, 14, verse 14 of chapter 6, he, he says, if you forgive other people, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, your Father will not forgive your sin. Wow. Of the various kinds of duty to which we're called in this prayer, I can't tell you how absolutely crucial that is. Jesus himself says it as directly as you can get. You know, we like to talk in our time, well, God has unconditional love. Yeah, he may have unconditional love, but that love, as I say, takes different forms. He doesn't want to see his children hardened toward others of his children. He wants that forgiveness because it's so crucial to life to be spread by us. I, I don't think the Bible could say it much clearer than that, even though there seems at times to be arguments about that. And Luther clearly comes down on the side of its li very literal meaning where he says, God's promised us assurance that everything is forgiven and pardoned, yet on the condition, it's not unconditional, yet on the condition that we also forgive our neighbor. For just as we sin greatly against God every day, and yet he forgives it all through grace, so we also must always forgive our neighbor who does us, wow, harm, violence, and injustice, or bears malice toward us. This is not easy, folks. It's not easy to follow Jesus and follow the cross. And Luther, as a very activist, I hope you've really sensed that, how powerfully active uh, his, his stance is toward what this prayer intends for us to do. And he very clearly says, if you do not forgive, do not think that God forgives you. But if you forgive, you have the comfort and assurance that you are forgiven in heaven, not on account of your forgiving. He does that freely of his grace because he's promised it, as the gospel teaches, but instead because he has set this up for our strengthening and assurance as a sign along with the promise that matches the petition in, in Luke 6, forgive and you will be forgiven. So once again, Luther does not uh, take sin lightly uh, just because he's had this wonderful experience of God's grace. He takes sin very seriously. He doesn't brush it off the way this little boy did when he said, it's not my fault that everything is my fault. Yeah. 
Okay, sixth petition, lead us not into temptation. And, and as you can certainly suspect here, this has to do with the devil as well. God himself tempts no one to sin, but we ask in this prayer that God would watch over us and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful self may not deceive us and draw us into false belief. Notice what he considers real sins here. False belief, despair, because we're not trusting in God at all. And other great and shameful things. I want to be very, very compassionate toward despairing people, but at the same time, I, I, because we're called upon to forgive and care, and, and I've got to remember there's forgiveness involved here, because despair, I give up on it all, and not, nothing's worth anything. It's all meaningless. You know, that, that, that's very painful, but it's also Luther, I, again, I don't claim this is equal to gospel. You can sort this out, but is this helpful at all for living as Christians today? And we pray that even though we are so tempted, we may still win the final victory. Well, what are these chief temptations that Luther's concerned about? Young people's chief... I'm going to go kind of fast here because I see we aren't really moving that along in the clock here. Young people, mostly the flesh, adults and others tempted by the world and its various kinds of temptations. And then Christians those who are concerned with spiritual matters are especially tempted by the devil. The devil really wants to work on us. No one can escape temptations and allurements. As long as we live in the flesh and have the devil prowling around, we can't help but suffer attacks and even be mired in them. But we pray here that we won't fall into them, interesting metaphor now, and be drowned by them. I mean, even Jesus was willing to experience the temptations of the devil, only in his case, obviously, no fall whatsoever. But we Christians, he says, must be armed and expect every day to be under continuous attack, Luther says. Even if at present I'm chaste, patient, kind, and firm in faith, the devil's likely at this very hour to send such an arrow into my heart that I can scarcely endure it, for he's an enemy who never lets up or becomes weary. When one attack ceases, new ones also arise. And at such times, our only help and comfort is to run here and seize hold of the Lord's prayer and to speak to God from the heart. Dear Father, you've commanded me to pray, let me not fall because of temptation. Then you'll see that the temptation has to cease and eventually admit defeat. Otherwise, this is sure contrary to much of the world today. If you attempt to help yourself by your own thoughts and resources, call on your inner strength, I mean, quote unquote, think of the things that are said in our time. That will only make matters worse and give the devil a wider opening. Maybe it's no wonder Lutheranism has never been at the forefront of American popular culture about take charge of your own life and think positively and all that. Luther's very realistic in terms of the, the cross in the midst of life and the devil. But deliver us from evil, which literally means deliver us from the evil one. He's absolutely correct here. In Greek, there's no question in the world what we're really praying Although sometimes, well, all the time, our translations don't really show this. We're really saying, deliver us from the evil one. It's very clear, as, as Luther says here. The devil incessantly seeks our life, vents his anger uh, by causing, look at this, accidents and injury to our bodies, crushes some, drives others to insanity. Look at this, some he drowns in water. Many he hounds to suicide or other dreadful catastrophes. Pray without ceasing against this arch enemy. For if God did not support us, we wouldn't be safe from him a single hour. And at the end, we sum it up by saying, Dear Father, help us to get... I mean, notice how realistic, almost depressingly so at times, Luther is. Help us to get rid of all this misfortune. This petition includes all the evil that may befall us under the devil's kingdom, poverty, disgrace, death, in short, all the tragic misery and heartache of which there is incalculably so much on earth. Wow. So let's conclude with, doxology, with the doxology here at the end. And, and James is talking here. I, I'm not going to read this one, but it's, it's the one where James says, pray without doubting. And Luther says, when he talks about thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. What does amen mean? It means, yes, it shall be so. We say amen because we are certain that such petitions are pleasing to our Father in heaven. Again, because Jesus taught them. You don't have to have any doubts about that. For he himself has commanded us to pray in this way. 
and has promised to hear us. Kind of a mouthful or several mouthfuls this morning, but any questions before we go into table talk about what Luther means here? Because here's what I'm going to suggest we do for table talk. Once again, you can go many different routes. One is more personal. Were you taught any prayers, you know, that you're, in effect you were memorizing as a child? And if so, what, what are some of those? What's one of the earliest prayers you can recall? What insight that Luther has regarding the Lord's Prayer is something where you thought, oh boy, I've never really thought of it that way. I, I need to keep that in mind when I pray it. You know, that we're, we probably can't accomplish all of this all in one fell swoop, but it helps to have at least a limited goal. And then did anything particularly surprise you? You know, like I, I told you about my surprise that I never think of government when I think of give us this day our daily bread. That would be just one example of something, oh, I got to remember. Of course, I read it you know, many times in the past, but I've, I've let that slip because it seems so unnatural. So that'd be an example of what surprised me. We've got, what, at least 10 or 11 minutes. Let's do that around our tables, please. Okay, thank you for batting those things around and coming. And next week, as I said earlier, uh, we'll move on to the section on baptism. And I'll, I'll put a special, baptism is a very short section of the small catechism. So I'm going to bring in some things about infant baptism. And what about this whole conflict in, in Christian history about infant baptism versus believers baptism only? So those are some of the issues we'll talk about. And what in the world, for, for many of us who were baptized as infants, what in the world does that really mean today? Wasn't that just a nice family ceremony or something? Those are the kinds of things we'll deal with. As I said earlier, you're welcome to take these sheets home, but if you do, please bring them back because then this way, and I think as I count the attendants, uh, if you leave uh, several here, we'll be fine. I won't have to ask anybody to make us any more for next week, so I appreciate that. Let's close with prayer. And Lord, we're certainly reminded today of how much you want us to come to you in prayer. Give us the words we need to say in terms of that which is pleasing in your sight so that we would pray that which is according to your will, whether it's a set prayer like the, the Lord's Prayer or that which we pray on our own. But Lord, always help us to pray according to your will because we know that you want a relationship with us and that it's so important that we ask for that which you so want to give us. So thank you that we can come to you. Thank you, Lord, that you who are creator of heaven and earth are our Father, our Redeemer, our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit within us as well. Thank you for that, O oh God. And in that confidence that we can walk as your children, help us indeed to do so this very week, this very day, this very moment. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.